<laughs> well, here we are, right? This is going to be um, a lecture where we're going to finish up the special senses. Uh, we'll finish up today with hearing and equilibrium. And then I'll give you a discussion of the endocrine system. And that's all we'll get done today. And that's right on schedule. And remember that there was a typo in the syllabus that uh, exam five did not include all the vocabulary numbers that it should have. And exam five should include on it 73 through 92, right? It doesn't say that. So it's going to pick up from where we were before with Plasti and go all the way through, I think, to Uni on 92. So Plasti through Uni. And uh, right now, you've got two things in front of you. You have a take-home exam. That take-home exam is covering uh, special senses, eye and ear, touch, is covering uh, digestive system that you've seen in lab, structurally. It is covering lymphatic system that you've been at least introduced to in a very you know, easy way in lab or will be on next Tuesday. And then finally, it covers a little bit over the, um, what am I missing? Endocrine system that I'll be discussing a little bit today. So you've got a little bit on those four different systems on this take-home exam. There are no mastering assignments in preparation for those. So right now, you've got a little bit of a break from mastering assignments. So please take advantage of this little break and do a really nice job on your take-home exam, as well as this is a great opportunity to knock your short paper out of the way. If you can get that done between now and next week, you'll be very happy because I don't want you stressing about your take-home exam or stressing out about your short paper while you're trying to finish up getting ready for exam number five on the cardiovascular system. So you'll do yourself a really big favor by getting the short paper out of the way and getting the take-home exam out of the way as soon as possible. That take-home exam, you could sit down and do it multiple, you know, not multiple times, but you could go down and choose just the questions out of a particular area and divide it up into multiple sittings so you're not trying to do it all at once. There are 100 questions. It's worth 50 points. And some people have already completed it. Most have not. A few have started from what I saw yesterday. Um, what else? Any other questions as far as logistics? Yes, ma'am. Um, so this vocab will be not on the take-home? There is no vocab on the take-home. Uh, correct. So the next vocab you'll have will be on the, on the next in-class exam on the cardiovascular system. And I think that comes in on the 20th. Which that would be exam four? Five. Five. The next exam will be not, it, whatever it says is wrong, it's going to be vocab 73 through 92. So we got about four more times together before that. I'll do five uh, slides or so of the vocab. Any questions, take home exam, short paper, anything what's going on right now? Yes, ma'am. So the take home exam online, is it not timed? It's not timed. Okay. okay. Nope, it's not timed. I was going to start it the other day, but I wasn't for sure. Nope, it's not timed. So you can have all the time you want. It's open resource. It's worth 50 points. You should do quite well on it. There's no reason for anyone to get, honestly, less than an 80. I mean, I hope better, but I really would hope that you can get 80% of it correct by having your notes in front of you. When you're doing that exam, make sure you have your textbook, your lab notes, and your, lab, your lecture notes. So have all your resources, and then you've got Dr. Google at your fingerprint, at fingertips as well. So you should do really well. Okay, uh, vocabulary then. Uh, picking up with 73, this will be on the cardiovascular exam, exam number five. Plasti. Some sort of surgical repair. Rhinoplasty would be a nose job, for example. Uh, planto. We saw plantar, plantar flexion a while back. Uh, plantar refers to the sole of your foot. There are also plantar warts, right? You don't want to walk around a podiatrist's office or walk around the gym without sandals on because you can pick up some plantar warts. Uh, platy. Think platypus. Uh, very flat beak. There's a muscle in your neck called the platysma. It's the one that allows you to do this. So by doing this, you're seeing my platysma. All right, that's your a muscle we didn't have in the, in the lab this semester, but it's that flat muscle in your neck. And then plegia means paralysis or paralyzed. You've seen hemiplegia and paraplegia and quadriplegia. Plex, you know what a plexus is. It's a group, a twisted group or woven group of nerves. P-N-E-A in a word like pneumonia or apnea, sleep apnea, uh, where you stop breathing, right? A, the absence of breathing, apnea, or eupnea, E-U, 
PNEA would be normal, good breathing. Pneumo, air, gas, or lungs. Uh, there's a term here, pneumothorax, as the example. A pneumothorax is when, for some reason, the pleura has been punctured. So think about this for a second. We'll be talking about this more in the respiratory system. Let me, let me get you thinking about this a little bit. If someone has a stabbing wound or a puncture wound to the chest, it's possible to break through the serous membrane around the lungs, the, peri the um, pleura. Now, the lungs expand whenever you expand your rib cage, right? So as you breathe in, you have muscles of respiration. They are going to open up your thoracic cavity, and your lungs kind of follow along because the lungs are basically vacuum sealed to your thoracic wall. If you poke through, though, and puncture that pleura, you break the vacuum seal. And now when the chest expands, the lungs won't expand with it, and you have a pneumothorax. And so you have a collapsed lung. So we have to go in and plug that hole. It'll heal. Uh, remember, this is a serous membrane. It's just an epithelial layer. Epithelial layers heal really quite well. But we have to go in and, and um, plug the hole or heal it up. Now, a, a pneumothorax can also happen from a person with a lung tumor. Or if you've got a lung cancer or a lung tumor, and that tumor then disrupts and, and, and breaks through that pleura, that too could cause a collapsed lung. But it would be some sort of damage or something where something has interfered with or broken that vacuum seal around the, the, the lungs. Pod, you go to the podiatrist for foot-related issues, POD, uh, referring to foot-like structures. We'll see some cells in the kidney called podocytes, cells with feet. Poe or poesis, the formation of or the production of or the making of something, there is a protein called erythropoietin. If we look at that word, it ends in I-N, it's a protein, erythro, red blood cells, poe, formation of. This is the hormone that's going to help make more red blood cells. And we'll talk about erythropoietin in a couple of, well, next week when we get to the blood chapter. Poly, many. Polymer, something with many parts. Polycythemia, we'll see that term a little bit later. Uh, remember emia, a condition of the blood? Right? Emia, condition of the blood. Poly, many, cyto, cells. Polycythemia means that there's too many cells, specifically red blood cells. So if your red blood cell count is too high, then you would be said to have polycythemia, which can be a problem. Uh, if your blood gets too congested, too filled, too thick, if you will, with red blood cells. Post, after, postnatal, after birth, and prim, think primitive, folks who were first, right? So first, prim, and then pre or pro both mean before in time or place. If you were to go to a school where they had a cadaver dissection lab, in, uh, you would not be in an introductory course actually doing any dissection. Instead, the cadaver, the donor, would have already been prosected. It would already have been cut to expose certain structures, and you would simply be observing somebody's prosection. It had been cut in advance, before in time. Procto refers to both the anus and the rectum. Now, you know they're not both the same, but the procto refers to both the anus or the rectum. Pseudo, remember pseudostratified, columnar, falsely stratified. Pseudo means false, and then psych a pretty good TV show. Taro, wing, pterodactyls, winged dinosaurs. There are, there's one bone in the body that is said to be pterygoid, wing-shaped. What bone might that be? In isolation, it kind of looks like it has butterfly wings. It's in the skull, the sphenoid. If you ever see the sphenoid bone all by itself in a picture, the sphenoid bone kind of looks like a bat or a, or a bird. It's got a couple wing-like structures, so it could be called pterygoid. Uh, pylor, gatekeeper. The pylorus, right, the, the bottom part of the stomach before you go into the duodenum, it's a gatekeeper. It's going to regulate what leaves the stomach and what starts to go into the intestines. If you have a pyogenic infection, it is one that is causing pus. So pyo, pus, and pyrogenic infection is one that's causing fever. Or maybe you know a pyro, somebody who loves matches and fire. 
and then quad, fourfold, quadriplegia, a person who has uh, limitations in all four of their uh, limbs, or quadriceps femoris, right, you know that's a, it's a muscle group with four members. And we'll stop there for the day, and we'll just keep on going through 92 over the next three lectures, and that'll get us right up in speed for the exam number five. Okay, so let's go to the senses, and is there anything at all? Last time we discussed touch. We talked about different sorts of senses, and we talked about the general versus uh, the special senses, and we also talked about how sense, uh, receptors sorry, are located in different places and how uh, receptors are responding to different kinds of stimuli. We went all the way through the eye, touch, smell, and taste. Is there anything in that conversation that I can clarify for you? You're really not too stressed out about this material because you know you're going to be quizzed on it with the book open. However, you do want to make sure that you're paying a special attention to, again, the eye and ear structures. Because even though on the take-home exam, you may be asked about the eye or the ear and you got your book open, remember you will see the eye or the ear and the ear on the lab practical exam. So you don't want to completely flush this material. You want to make sure you're keeping track of your eye and your ear. Make sure you're keeping track of the location of your endocrine organs because that will be on the lab exam. Uh, make sure you're thinking about the lymphatic organs. You'll see that in lab tonight and next Tuesday. It'll be on this exam and it'll be on the lab exam. And um, digestive, right? Again, digestive organs, you'll be asked about that on the take-home exam. So really what you're doing is just keeping some of these lab objectives fresh. And you're only three weeks away, three and a half weeks away from the lab exam. So it's not going to be that long. Three weeks from today, we're eating turkey. Four weeks from today, we are finishing up our lab exams. So in less than a month, we'll be done with lab and everything related with lab. And then five weeks from today, we're already done. Finals week is over with. So it's going to come really fast. So hang in there. Don't... Uh, Eat your leafy, vitamin, your leafy vegetables and, and, and stay healthy. The good part about this little section is that we already know the ear. So the structures of the ear here will be, I think, rather easy. You know that the ear can anatomically be divided into three regions, the outer or the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The external ear is anything a Q-tip can touch. So we're talking about the auricle, the flappy part of your ear. That can also be called the pinna. Then there's the auditory canal, and along that auditory canal, at the very back of it, we get to the eardrum, what we'll call the tympanic membrane. Along the way, you have some specialized epithelial cells that secrete earwax, that lovely stuff, right? Now, cerumen is a fancy word for that earwax. So you have ceruminous glands that make the cerumen, and I think of earwax being like lava. Right, it's kind of erupting all the time, slowly moving, and it's sort of like the tears of your ear. <laughs> right? The tears are there to keep wiping things away from your ear, maintaining your vision, and the cerumen is kind of there like a lava, a slow lava flow, moving outward, keeping things from interfering with or damaging your tympanic membrane. Uh, just a slightly different, you know, Aren't we so glad, though, that we don't have ceruminous glands on our fingers or anywhere else in our body? Can you imagine if you're oozing earwax anywhere else? Right? Kind of gross. The middle ear, once you get past the tympanic membrane, now you're in the middle ear. This is an air-filled chamber, normally, and it's where you find the three ossicles, the three bones, uh, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. These three bones, we'll talk about how this all works in a minute, <laughs> are also right next to a tube that goes down from the middle ear to the throat, to the pharynx. And that tube is called the auditory tube, that's the easiest, or the eustachian tube, or you'll see it also called the pharyngeal tympanic tube, tube because it goes from the tympanic membrane down to the pharynx, down to the throat. And then finally, once you get past <clears throat> the middle ear, you enter into the inner ear, and that is where you find both the semicircular canals 
and the cochlea. And we'll talk about the basics of hearing and of balance today. In the inner ear, you are going to see a series of fluid-filled chambers. And in those fluid-filled chambers, there are going to be, quote, hair cells. And those hair cells are like the nerve endings. And we'll talk about how you perceive sound and how you maintain your balance because of these hair cells and because of this fluid in a few minutes. So a picture like this, not difficult to label, I would hope. We see the blue, the uh, pink, and the yellow areas representing the outer, the middle, and the inner ear. Again, the external ear goes as far as the tympanic membrane, Okay, everything a Q-tip can touch. Then within this narrower middle ear, there are the three ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, M-I-S, right, M-I-S, from outside to in. This is also where you find this eustachian tube that usually is closed, um, but it travels up from the pharynx and comes up into the middle ear. This is how bacteria crawl up into your ear to give you a middle ear infection. And you also know that your tympanic membrane is very sensitive. If you ever missed with a Q-tip, you know that if you touch your eardrum, it hurts, right? It's very innervated, lots of nerve endings. So if bacteria get up there in the middle ear, and they're creating pressure and fluid buildup, and they're pushing on that tympanic membrane from the back, that's going to be very uncomfortable, right? That, that pain. Question? Um, what causes, because when I went to Vegas, like my ears on the plane, Absolutely. Like Let's talk about that, okay? So if you're flying, what do you want to do? Remember, this is normally an air-filled chamber. That means you have air outside, atmospheric pressure on the outside, and you have atmospheric pressure, air back here in the middle ear. When you're flying, if you're having that discomfort during takeoff or landing, you would want to typically yawn, open your mouth really, really big, and yawn or chew gum or suck on a lozenge or something like that. And when you do that, it props open this tube and hopefully neutralizes the pressure from the atmosphere and on the inside of your ear. Now, if those pressure changes are awfully different, what are you doing? If the pressure difference is significant, you're either pushing in on the tympanic membrane or you're pushing out on the tympanic membrane. Either way, it doesn't feel good. So if you yawn, chew, do something, or just kind of get something to open up that tube and, and, and get that air to flow on both sides. But what if you've got an infection? What if you have a cold? What if you have a sinus infection? You're not going to be able to neutralize that pressure because you've got gunk up there. So if, you've got, if you don't have a cold, you usually can very easily pop it or feel that pressure difference by yawning or sucking. If you've got a cold, though, it can be very miserable the whole way there or back because you're not going to get it to neutralize or, or, or equalize on each side, okay? Um, now, let's talk about something else. That stapes is sitting on top of an opening called the... Oval window, right? Does it... That stapes looks like a little Monopoly piece, doesn't it, right? And so that stapes, the base of it, is oval in shape. To go from the middle ear into the inner ear, you must crawl through this space called the oval window. Once you are in the, through the oval window, now you're in the inner ear. As you enter into the inner ear, you enter into an area called the vestibule. Now, the vestibule is a generic word. You'll see a vestibule, an oral vestibule, a nasal vestibule, a vaginal vestibule. It's the opening into. It's a generic anatomical term. So as you go into the vestibule, as you go into the, the inner ear, I always think of it, you're going to a big hotel lobby, right? You're going into the entryway. And off to one side, you have the three semicircular canals. And off to the other side of the lobby, you have the cochlea. You're inside this big chamber, and these two parts of the hotel are connected by the same water system. So we're going to see some fluid that is able to move from the cochlea area over to the semicircular area. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. 
but that's all housed within the semicircular canals and in the cochlea. You are now deep within the temporal bone, right? So the cochlea and the semicircular canals are finding their home deep within the temporal bone. And then we see on here the eighth cranial nerve, right? Number eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve, and it carries both information from the semicircular canals for balance and from the cochlea for hearing. So those are the structures. There's one more little opening here I just want to point out, and I'll talk about it at the end, and that is this little round window. So there are two windows in the ear, oval window, round window. Just note that they're there, and we'll come back to that at the end. Any questions about just the structures of the ear? Okay. And everything I've said is now here in words, okay? So... Uh, again, this middle ear, and you asked about this, Karen, the middle ear is usually uh, normally closed, that eustachian tube. And so it's just a little slit-like opening down to the nasopharynx, and that's why if you're chewing or yawning, you can open up that slit and neutralize the pressures on both sides. In the, when we get to the, di uh, the respiratory system next week in lab, a full week away, uh, you'll see in some of the pictures a little opening in the nasal passages and down in the throat where this eustachian tube opens up. But it's up in the nasal pharynx. You know where that is. Um, again, in, in the uh, middle ear, we have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and those are the little bones called the ossicles. Now, this is a, a blow-up of the middle ear. Isn't this cute? So here's your tympanic membrane. And these are the three smallest little bones in your body, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And they all have their own little ligaments, and they're attached to the temporal bone, and they're attached to each other. I mean, these are tiny. You may not have spent any time looking at them in the lab, but we have two sets of ossicles upstairs. One is in a little, like, pill case, three little bones. The other is embedded in a, a plexiglass uh, display case. But they were sitting around, and we'll probably pull them out again, but tiny, tiny, tiny little bones. Now, there's a couple of muscles attached to these bones. These are both uh, kind of fun to know. The tensor timp tympani, or tympani. Um, what's a tympani in orchestra? Like the big kettle drum, right? So that's kind of what the, this big you know, eardrum, right? The tympanic membrane, tympani, the big kettle drum kind of structure. There's another muscle up here that I want you to know, though, that's attached to the stapes called the stapedius. Cute little muscle. Now, the stapedius is, see how it's attached to the stapes? This muscle will contract as you are exposed to louder sounds. So as you are walking toward a loud noise, this little stapedius contracts. It's a reflexive type thing. You don't have control over it, of course. What's happening as that muscle contracts? What is it doing for you? It's pulling that stapes back away from the oval window. If I pull the stapes back from the oval window, that means not as much energy and loud sounds can get into my cochlea where it could potentially cause nerve damage. So a really loud sound, now, this is only if you're approaching a loud sound. So if you're walking toward a concert, walking into church, whatever, where it's kind of loud and, you know, it can be kind of loud, that's where the stapedius can pull back and save your hearing a little bit. This is not going to protect you against a, a, a gunshot sound, right? An instant sound where there isn't time for that muscle to pull back. So this is only good for your walking toward a louder sound. Okay, it just can't happen fast enough for a loud, fast sound. But I want you to know that, about that little uh, stapedius muscle. Okay. Any questions about just practicality of that? Kind of a neat thing. And here's a couple more notes about the middle ear. Again, you're in an air-filled chamber, right? This, this cavity is sometimes referred to as the tympanic cavity. It's an air-filled chamber of the middle ear. Now we finally get into the inner ear, and like I mentioned before, you are bordered by, uh, as you go behind the stapes and you look through this oval window, 
you're now entering into the vestibule, into the opening of the inner ear. And off to one side, you'll see the semicircular canals. To the other side, you'll see the cochlea. Part of the vestibule, kind of a, just off from the vestibule, are two other little sac-like structures. One is referred to as the utricle, one the saccule. I'm not going to quiz you specifically on those two structures, but I'll show you a picture in a moment. Now, those semicircular canals are part of the vestibular system. Right, so this word vestibule is used in a strange kind of way to talk about this series of structures that are important for your balance. And then off to the other side, of course, again, you have your cochlea for hearing. Now inside, I mentioned that the hotel, these two parts, the, the cochlea and the semicircular canals are connected by a fluid-filled area. And this fluid, as we'll see, is going to be responsible for both helping with your equilibrium and for your hearing. And let's take a look at this. This is a picture on the left. You have your three semicircular canals. On the right, you see the cochlea. The pink tubing, you can see connects everything, kind of all connects together. And that fluid is floating through the semicircular canals and in the cochlea. That fluid within the tubes is called endolymph. Now, in lab tonight and next Tuesday, you're going to hear very briefly about the lymphatic system. And you're going to hear about lymph. Lymph is fluid that's between your cells and in your lymphatic vessels. It's fluid that is not in your blood. It's fluid that's not your plasma of your blood. And so endolymph simply refers to the fluid within, right? Endo means within, within these tubes. Then there's also these blue-filled areas, not to get really fancy here, but then there are other fluid-filled cha channels, and they are filled with fluid called perilymph, around, right? So we have endo and perilymph. Not to get too excited about it, but I wanted you to see that. Now, let, what is this fluid doing? Let's figure this out. Oh, also, what is this? That is the oval window, right? It's an opening, it's oval in shape, not hard to imagine. And once you go in, into that, now you're in the vestibule, which includes that little structure called the utricle and the saccule. And then off to the side, your three semicircular canals, and off to the other side, your cochlea. Let's figure out what's happening here. Here we're dealing with just with balance in the vestibular system. There are those series of semicircular canals. They are fluid filled with that endolymph. And that fluid um, is in those tubes. And lining those tubes are hair cells. Now, that's a bad word, hair. It's not like hair in your head. Again, when I talked about olfactory system, I said the olfactory nerve had hairs. Those were nerve endings. So what you have is this person is standing still. She's upright, her head is upright. So there is going to be fluid, and these hair cells are standing erect. They're just sitting still. That tells you, because those hairs are straight up and not being bent, then your nervous system perceives you as being level, right? Your head is level. Now, when this person looks down, fluid in these chambers is going to flush over these hair cells, and bend them. So once, once, these bear, once these hair cells bend, that sends a nervous signal to your brain telling you that you're looking down. Okay. Now you've got three sets, of, or you have two sets of these semicircular canals. Each set has three canals, and you've seen them, right? Three semicircular canals, just as the name suggests. Look at my fingers. One is in the x-axis, one's in the y-axis, one is in the z-axis. Each of these three semicircular canals is in a different axis. In algebra, we learned about x and y being the two points of a coordinate. And then the x, sorry, the z-axis was the axis that can go in and out of the page. So you've got a three-dimensional space with x, y, and z-axis. And you've got two of these sets of semicircular canals. 
no matter which way my head turns or twists or whatever, fluid in one or more of those semicircular canals is going to be moving over those hair cells. That is how your body knows if you're looking up, down, sideways, falling, going upside down, whatever, because you have two of these instruments in your ears reporting on every movement you're making. And as long as these two instruments are in sync, you're going to have good balance, right? No vestibular, no balance issues from your inner ear. Now, um, there's also the saccule and the utricle that I'll mention here in a moment. Okay. Now, these three uh, semicircular canals are sort of like a gyroscope. Now, a gyroscope is that little kind of funky little ball instrument that you'll see in a, in a plane, or maybe some people have them in a car. It's that kind of rolling compass-looking ball thing. And, and what that's going to tell a pilot is if in, in inclement weather, they can tell it's like a level, but in three dimensions, if they're going up or down, left or right. So if they have that little gyroscope perfectly centered, it means that the plane is level and they're not veering up or down, left or right. So basically, that's what these two sets of semicircular canals are for you. You have two gyroscopes in your head. And they are constantly sending signals to your brain at all moments. We would say that these signals are tonic, right? They never phase out. They are tonic. They never stop sending, sending signals to your brain. And you are constantly aware of your position, OK? So you can close your eyes, and you know if you're looking up or down, side to side because of that proprioception, but also because of the semicircular canals and the bending hairs. Okay. Same thing is true, and, and I, I, I've just said this, you have this endolymph, right, this fluid. It's, it's going through these semicircular canals. There's hair cells along the way, and as the hair, uh, sorry, as the fluid washes against these hair cells, you're going to perceive that motion. The semicircular canals are reporting to your brain on angular movement, right? moving angularly. The utricle and the saccule also have fluid, and they also have hair cells, and they're reporting more on up and down and forward motion. So when you're accelerating in a car, you know you're accelerating. Not only is your butt being pushed back into the seat, but your inner ear is also telling you through the utricle that you are moving forward okay, and continuing to accelerate. Cool, cool stuff. Now, the semicircular canals are also working with your eyes. Okay, they're helping to coordinate with your eyes. They're also helping to coordinate with your cerebellum. Remember, we talked about the cerebellum as being the part of the brain stem that is helping to coordinate your muscle movement. And your body is going to quickly react to challenges of your balance. So if you begin to fall, your semicircular canals are going to report that to the brain, and you are reflexively going to be sending signals from your cerebellum to the muscle groups, helping you to maintain your balance. This is all split-second kind of stuff, but it's going to help maintain your balance. Now, as we get older, our semicircular canals may not be as good, and our cerebellum may not be as good, so our balance becomes less, you know, less good, right? We start having some balance issues, falling more often, or having issues with that reaction time to falling. So here you see that this guy is turning his head uh, at the top right. He's, he's turning his head in one direction. Well, as you turn your head in one direction quickly, you know what's happening, right? There's fluid moving in at least one of those semicircular canals washing over those hair cells. So you're aware that you're moving. Keep going around in a circle, right? Little kids games around a bat, whatever. You're on a, a merry-go-round. You're going around and around and around and around. And then you stop. And the world keeps spinning. The world's really not spinning, but why is it spinning? The fluid's, the fluid's still going in a circle, right? So you're moving, and that fluid is still going, even though you stopped. So for a couple of seconds, you think the world's still spinning because your brain's telling you that it is, right? Because the fluid's still moving. And then that fluid comes to a stop, and all of a sudden now, the world is back to being straight up again. Right? So, you're just moving that fluid, and you know the faster you're moving it, the longer it's going to take for you to kind of recover from that. But it's not terribly long. Do the senses ever like fight with themselves? You ever like go in like those houses where they have like the angles? Absolutely. Like, level, Absolutely. Like, angles, angles, angles. 
so, so being on an angle, looking through mirrors, and what if you have an ear infection and one gyroscope is sending you one signal and the other gyroscope is saying something a little bit different, now you're going to feel like the room is spinning. And absolutely, all of those things happen. So some people will have nerve damage on one ear or they'll have little crystals in that endolymph. Imagine, what if you had little calcium crystals in your endolymph? Those little crystals could kind of land like little stones and bend a hair. The fluid's not moving, but the calcium, the calcium uh, uh, stone basically just told your brain on one side that it's moving. And that can cause all sorts of balance disorders. And there's a whole family of diseases, uh, vestibular disorders, Meniere's disease, where people suddenly lose their balance uh, because there's these little crystals building up in their ear. And there's a few things that can be done, but not too many things that can be done for that. Uh, so I'll come back and talk about this a little bit more in a moment. But are we getting the idea, right? This fluid, three different uh, orientations, giving you a double gyroscope kind of structure, telling you where you are in space. And that's it for balance right now. I'll come back and talk about balance in a moment. Now let's just move over to the other side of the inner ear, and go into the cochlea and talk about hearing. It's kind of the same idea. There's still fluid and there's still hair cells, but rather than perceiving balance, we're gonna be perceiving sound, okay? So within that cochlea, within that snail-like structure, if you could uh, untwirl that cochlea, uh, you would see that um, there's actually, well, let me back up you will hear that the cochlea is responsible for hearing. And that's true. Within the cochlea, though, there's a more specific structure referred to as the organ of corti, named after a person, so it's capitalized. The organ of corti, and, and this is actually where the hair cells are, if you will, where sound is perceived. And so these organs of corti, or spiral organs, are within the cochlea. So if I cut into the cochlea, it'll look a lot like the semicircular canals in a way. I'm going to see a bunch of fluid-filled chambers. And those fluid-filled chambers are going to have little microscopic areas where the organ of cordy are. And all this information is going to travel to the eighth nerve, right? So this is all information that's going to be traveling down the eighth nerve. So you've got this very complex you know, cochlea layer after layer of this fluid. Now, if I could zoom in to those little areas where I just circled, again, what you're going to see, oops, what you're going to see, fluid and little hair cells. Same idea, right? Fluid and hair cells. Those little hair cells are nerve endings. And so the actual uh, organ of cordy would be, you know, this area where this is actually happening. And here's basically what happens. And I'm kind of oversimplifying this, but that's okay for what we're doing this semester. So sound waves come in. They're going to wiggle the tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane should be nice and soft, if you will. It's, te it's tense, right? It's, it's tense, like a kettle drum, but still it can wiggle from the vibration of the sound waves. That sound energy is going to be transferred through the three ossicles. So that information is going to wiggle through the malleus, get transferred to the incus, and then eventually go to the stapes. That vibrational information is then going to crawl through or move through the oval window and into the inner ear. Here, it's going to go into that vestibule and go off to the side where it meets the cochlear structures. And again, we have fluid-filled chambers. Now here, the cochlea has been kind of stretched out, kind of unwoven, un unwound. Sound waves have two ways of describing them. If you've taken any kind of physical science or physics along the way, you know that there's two ways to describe a wave. Right? Waves go up and down, up and down. There's the frequency of the wave, how often it comes. What's the frequency of the wave? How frequent the wave is, is going to be detected by your body as pitch. So a high frequency sound is going to be a high pitch. A low frequency sound is going to be bass. 
That's how fast the waves are coming in. The other thing that waves are described as as how tall are they? What's their amplitude? A really loud sound would have a larger amplitude, and a soft sound would have a smaller amplitude. Those waves are coming in. Different frequencies, different amplitudes. Amazing how this works. And that sound wave is basically going to come in and tickle, that's just my way of saying it, tickle certain places along the cochlea. Now, depending upon how tall that wave is and how frequently that wave is, is uh, coming through, you're going to perceive it as a higher pitch, a lower pitch, a louder sound, or a softer sound. That fluid is going to wave that little hair cell in a particular area that is programmed to your brain to say that's a high pitch, that's a low pitch. OK, so you're going to be OK. And then it's going to tickle that, that little hair cell. Same kind of idea. It's going to bend the hair cell, disrupt it. The brain's going to perceive it as sound. But now, this is what's cool. Now all that energy that's been building up in your cochlea has to leave. And it's going to leave out the round window. Remember I showed you that round window? There's two windows in the inner ear. There's the oval window going in. There's actually the round window coming out. You've been to a loud concert? and you still kind of hear it a couple of hours later, you're still hearing that, that I don't know how to describe it, but that, that sound, right? It just doesn't go away. All that energy, all those loud sounds went in, all those, that wave, that's energy, goes into your middle ear and is whacking around in your cochlea. And then it's all coming back out into your middle ear. You're basically, quote, swallowing those sound waves. But look, if enough energy went in, enough energy comes out, and basically can kind of reshape the tympanic membrane from the inside. So you kind of have this reverberating sound going on for a couple of hours, right, after a loud concert. It dissipates, right? But that's kind of what's going on there. Yes? Is that the same thing when your ears are ringing? It can be, although tinnitus, or tinnitus, you'll hear it pronounced both ways, uh, is a different issue. Uh, you can have that ringing, though, after a loud concert or something, but then some people have that all the time, and it's a, it's a disorder. So they hear whooshing or sounds all the time uh, because of a, different dis a, diff a number of different disorders in the ear. Okay. So that's the basics, I mean, very, very basics of how the ear works and how balance is accomplished, part of what balance is accomplished. And then last slide, this is the hearing pathway or the eighth cranial nerve pathway. We talked about the visual pathway. Remember the vision comes through the optic nerve, crosses over at the chiasm, right, and then goes to the occipital lobe. And then I also showed you the taste pathway, going from the tongue, going in, and then going to the brain. This is the same kind of idea. So here we have, on one side of the brain, the cochlea and the semicircular canals. That information is going to travel in through the eighth cranial nerve. Hmm. But some of this information is involved with balance, isn't it? So does it make sense to you that some of the information from the ear, from the semicircular canals, is going to go to the cerebellum? Because I told you already that that's all part of that balance reflex. So your ear is telling your body what to do. Your cerebellum is helping to coordinate all that muscle movement. Does it also make sense to you, from what we talked about before, that some of these signals are going to come into the brain and report to the thalamus. Remember I told you the thalamus was the gateway to your cerebrum, but it was also in the thalamus where your emotional centers of your brain are based. So some music makes us happy. Some music makes us angry, right? We know that music, sound, can influence our emotions. Ooh, and can balance ever influence your emotions? If you've ever had any sort of balance disorder, or you know how nauseous you can get, but that can really strike a bad mood with you too. So if you're getting you know, inconsistent balance signals coming in from your ear, that can make you very grumpy and very appropriately so because life is kind of moving and the world's spinning and that's no fun. So clearly the ear can speak to your cerebellum for balance. It also speaks to your emotional centers of your brain your sense of well-being, all that kind of stuff. And then you see that it decussates and goes over to the other side, and your auditory cortex 
is found largely on your temporal lobe. Right, so it's the temporal lobe that receives much of the hearing information. Notice, however, that it completely decussates to the other side of the brain. And that is what I wanted to share with you as far as hearing and balance. Any dis discussion or questions about that? There's more to it, but that's a really easy, I think, reasonably straightforward way of presenting it at this point. Again, we'll be diving into vision and hearing and balance more next semester, but we'll at least by then, we'll know the structures, and we'll be able to pull out the parts of the ear and, the, and different nerves and your cranial nerves. That'll be conversation that you already will go back and review, and then we'll build on that information as we go into more of the physiology of the body next semester. This is always where I pause for a moment, too, and go back and I tell you why balance is why I started off with this whole presentation, presentation saying that you know balance is the sixth sense. And um, the reason is, is that about, it's been 18 years now. 18 years ago, I went to the dentist and got an infection from a crown that was being put on. That infection was a staphylococcus infection, bacterial infection. And that bacterial infection went systemic, went through my blood. And some of that infection settled in my left SC joint. Now that is your sternoclavicular joint, so between the sternum and the clavicle, okay? And that's just where the bacteria kind of hung out and created for me a lot of pain. It was an infection. So I went to the emergency room with pain in my chest and my shoulder, and the doctor um, prescribed to me some antibiotics to kill off the organism that was appropriate. And the antibiotic they gave me, one of them was genomycin. Now, genomycin is one of those antibiotics that has some serious side effects if it's not carefully monitored and carefully watched. Um, I was on that antibiotic for six weeks, way longer than I should have been, and I kept questioning him, but he kept saying to me, don't worry about it, we know what we're doing, uh, you know, the, the warnings are just, you know, peripheral, don't worry about it. Well, it turns out that genomycin, one of the things it can do, if given long enough and in high enough doses, can destroy the hair cells in the semicircular canals. So one day I woke up unable to see well and unable to walk. I mean, I was just dizzy and nauseous and a mess. Well, what happened is that that genomycin uh, started to destroy, it was ototoxic, toxic toward the ear structures, and it destroyed all the hair cells in my semicircular canals. Over the next three to four, six months, that dying process continued. And during that six-month period, my two gyroscopes were sending me misinformation. So I was spinning and the world was spinning uh, for about six months. So I was completely unable to walk, completely unable to, to ambulate. Um, vision was a mess. Everything was just haywire. And at that point, they weren't sure what was going on, but they thought I would recover from it. Well, that was the beginning of nine years of total disability. And so for the next four years, I learned how to walk again because without those semicircular canals, right, I had no gyroscope. And you have to retrain your body how to walk because now I had no automatic signals coming from my brain or my central nervous system telling me where I was. I still don't. My entire balance is based upon my vision and my proprioception, the feeling in my feet. If I close my eyes, I can't tell you if I'm sitting up, standing up, falling over, unless I feel my feet. So my feet have become my sensors of where I am and my vision. So balance is really like a three-legged stool, right? So one leg of the stool are your semicircular canals. You can live without them, but if you don't have that stool, you're kind of uneven, and now you're depending heavily on vision and on proprioception. If I were to go blind or lose my vision, I would definitely do that back in a wheelchair because I wouldn't be able to deal with just one leg of the stool. Or if I had diabetic issues with my feet, right, any kind of nerve issues or, or pro sensation issues with my feet, I also would be back in a wheelchair because I wouldn't be able to do this. But for the first four years, I fell all the time. I fell going downstairs, walking everywhere, uh, was in a wheelchair for most of those four years, and um, nursing home twice as a resident, uh, trying to recover from falls and things that had happened to me. 
slowly I became stronger. I went through a lot of rehab, and that rehab included walking on a treadmill, hold on tight, walk on the treadmill, and read closed caption television. Nothing is more horrible because it would make me terribly nauseous. And my instructions were to do that four to six times a day until you throw up. So walk and read and throw up. Get terribly nauseous. Walk and read and throw up. And keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. Eventually, you tell your body, stop caring. Right? It's, it's, it's OK. This craziness you're feeling, this nausea you're feeling, just stop worrying about it. So you basically train your body not to be nauseous from all that movement. Um, the other thing that thing does, as you, the other thing that the vestibular system do is works with your eye, right? I told you that as you, like if this room, we were having an earthquake, right? And this room suddenly shifted, your inner ear would feel that movement and your muscles would react very quickly and you likely wouldn't fall. You would responsively kick and put the muscles in the right place. That's all reflex, isn't it? The vestibular system also works with your eye. So when you move, when you move your head, that fluid is moving. Instantly, your brain is aware of that movement, and it actually moves your eye in the opposite direction so that you can maintain your gaze. So if you're looking at a, a clock or you're looking up at the screen, and imagine this for a moment. You're just looking at the guy up there turning his head in the upper right-hand corner. And you're going to turn your head quickly, left or right, but you're going to keep your eyes gazed on that image. What happens? you can keep your vision, right? You don't lose focus of that guy, right? Am I right? Do you lose focus of the picture when you turn your head quickly? Right? It's still there, right? You still see it. When I turn my head, because I don't have that coordination anymore from my, from my gyroscope, everything blurs and moves on me. So every time I move my head, my vision blurs. When I walk, I can't see faces. I can't read signs. I can't read anything. And so... So you'll see me, when, whenever I'm walking in the classroom, you'll see me pace back and forth. It's not that I'm nervous, but as long as I'm walking, I'm getting feedback from my feet. I know that I'm upright. If I stop, I can start teetering. And usually when I stop, I'm next to a table or very close to a wall, but I have to constantly make that decision. It's a very conscious choice for me to stay upright. And I have to be, everywhere I go, I have to be kind of monitoring where I am and where am I going to go if I need to grab onto something. Same is true when I'm, when I'm driving. When I'm driving, I can't see where I'm going. Now, with or without glasses, it doesn't matter. Because if the road is bumpy, and we live in Michigan, so all the roads are bumpy, right? So as the car is bumping, my vision is going up and down. And if the car is shimmying left to right, my vision is going left to right. So basically, my world is doing this kind of thing all the time. At nighttime, it's like watching fireworks, a bunch of cars. I mean, I just see taillights, and they're kind of just like this all over the place. But after many years of forcing my brain to just ignore all the noise, I just drive down the middle of it all. And I assume that the kid on the bicycle is smart enough to be over on the side, although I think he's in the middle of the road. A little bit. If my family knew what I saw when I drove, they wouldn't ride with me, right? <laughs> but everything's moving. So the fire hydrant is in the middle of the road, then it's over here, then it's in the middle of the road, then it's over here. But I've learned to go down the middle of it, and it's okay. And I can see cars in front of me. I can see big signs, but I can't read any signs when I'm driving. I certainly can't read my phone or, or, or anything like that. And I have to really concentrate. The worst thing for me is, is uh, construction cones, right? Little things going by me nighttime, lights. It's really quite um, spectacular, I suppose, if you like fireworks. But after a long time, I've really kind of got used to it, and I don't know what anything else is anymore. It's been 18 years now. Um, but it took me about four years to learn how to read again, not to learn how to read, but to hold my head still enough to read. Because any movement at all, the words would jump. So I had to develop very, very strong neck muscles so that my head is very, very still. And thankfully, I don't get a lot of migraines from it, but I, I very, very strong, steady neck. The worst thing in the world for me is when I'm in the bleachers at an athletic event, and there's a kid on the other end 
bouncing up and down. That seems so innocent, but that little bit of motion, I can't see anymore. I can't focus anymore. Everything's moving. And so that just drives me nuts. Sit. You know, I, 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 I feel like the little old lady, right? Sit down, right? But he's way down there. But that little bit of movement, I'm moving, and so I can't see clearly. Or we're at a concert, and everyone's clapping. Well, when I clap, I can't see anymore. So I don't clap. I look like the grumpy old man, right? I'm just sitting there. Um, but I don't stand up. I don't clap. I don't do those things because the moment I do, I have to choose. Do I want to see or do I want to show like I appreciate what's going on? So it's just been a, a many, many years of accommodating and getting used to it. Um, but I've been, I've been back to work now for about nine years, I guess. Nine years I didn't work, and nine years I've been back to work. Uh, so... I was told I would never walk again, never drive again, never work again, never be functional again, uh, over and over and over. And I uh, beat the odds for sure. So would that be like a medical malpractice? It definitely was a medical malpractice type situation. Uh, in the end, the doctor was found to be harmless. Um, the hospital took some responsibility and paid my medical bills uh, to the tune of about $800,000. And this is 18 years ago, so now it would be millions of dollars. In in medical bills. So some of that got taken care of, but not, not enough of it. Yeah. 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 Crazy stuff. Um, crazy, crazy stuff. Any questions about balance? I mean, it's really kind of interesting. It's, it's, disease is really interesting when, you, when it's somebody else. Uh, and I've adjusted to it pretty well. Um, I would never pass a sobriety test on the side of the road at night. If I was ever pulled over at night and told to walk the, the line, they'd be pulling me in. Because I, I, no way I could be steady. Um, nighttime, I'm really challenged. And I don't walk on plush carpet because anything that my feet, at the beach, <laughs> um, you know, that soft footing on the beach, I, you, I might as well crawl out to the beach. I hate going to the beach. I love the beach, but I hate going because that soft footing. I've now got the water moving in the horizon. I've got soft footing on my feet. I'm a mess. I'm an absolute basket case at the beach. Um, in fact, for years, I couldn't even go to the pool because the rippling of the water would make me nauseous. I'd throw up. So I've gotten past that, thankfully. I can go to the beach now and not throw up. But it's, it's really a challenge for me. And if it's nighttime and, and um, there's lights or construction cones, I get really angry. I get really irritable. And I understand why, right? You understand why. Because my semicircular canals do speak to my thalamus, which tells me that I'm pissed off. And so I understand that. And my family, unfortunately, bears the brunt of that sometimes because I'll be driving and I'll start, I, don't, I just kind of get scattered a little bit and I'm starting to lose it and I kind of get, I, I get angry. It makes sense. Um, they'll tell me, oh, don't forget, Dad, turn at Maple Street. I'm like, where's Maple Street? I can't see it, right? So they have to remind me. I basically, they need to be my GPS. They need to tell me where to turn, uh, slow down and turn. Uh, so it makes it really interesting. I drive a very, very small car. And the reason I love my little car, it took me a while to figure this out, is that I can sit, and in one head position, I can see out my rear view mirror, and I can move my eyes and see both side mirrors. Right? And so I don't have to move a lot of head. I, I don't have to do that, because if I move my head, things start blurring. So I can keep my head really steady, see out my rear view mirror, see my two side mirrors, all just by looking out with my head still. When I get my wife's bigger car, I have to turn my head to look out the rear view mirrors and the side mirrors, and I get, I get confused. And so my little car, it's really small, so I can kind of weave on the road, and nobody, I'm still in my lane. <laughs> and, and it's okay, right? Uh, but a bigger car, I, I've got more, you know, restraint, so I have to be really careful with my wife's bigger car. But I love my little car um, because I can, I can, I guess, have more weaving and still be okay. Yeah. Anyway, many, many fun stories. They weren't fun at the time, but they're kind of comical, I guess, when you hear them now about dealing with all this. I belong to a group called Wobblers Anonymous. We have an internet website, uh, people who have had similar uh, damage to their inner ear. And so Wobblers Anonymous, we're all over the, we're everywhere. And uh, there's a few hundred members of that group. So any thoughts on hearing or balance? Oh, last thing I want to tell you. So that means that when I'm walking across this room, I can't see the screen. I know what's on the screen. I've looked at it before but I'm pointing to stuff that's moving. I really can't focus on it. And also, when you're walking down the hallway, or I'm walk when I'm walking down the hallway, please know I'm not being rude, but I don't know who you are because I can't see your face. I can't make out who you are. 
So I'll say, hello, dear. Hi, sir. How are you? You'll say hello to me unless I know your voice or I saw you earlier that day and I was sitting still and I remember what you were wearing. I really am not sure who you are. So please don't be insulted if I don't know, if I don't call you by name because I honestly don't know who you are if I'm moving. Now, if I'm standing still and you're moving, I'm okay. But if I'm moving, I'm not seeing your face. Okay. Is that why when you're walking back and forth, like you always look down at the ground? Yeah. And I don't make eye contact with you because I really can't see your face. You're just a blur. Now, you're okay right now, but the moment I do this, you just went like this. You just kind of blur. And um, the best way I can remember it is I remember years ago recording. I was going somewhere on vacation or walking somewhere, and I was walking on a trail while looking through a camcorder. And I had that jumbled view, right, that horrible jumbled view. And that's what I remember as the best thing to describe what I experience. So when I'm walking, it's like that camcorder motion. It's just constantly jumping around, and it never stabilizes. Um, and I just got used to it. Isn't that kind of, because I know if I watch like camcorder videos like that, sometimes it can make you nauseous. Oh, yeah. Watching oh, it. oh, yes. I don't go to, um, when I go to a big movie, I don't sit toward the front. I've got to be sitting to the back so I can get perspective. I've got to be able to see that the screen has an edge and that I know that it's really not moving. I've gotten nauseous just sitting in my living room looking at my TV. I've gotten past that for the most part, but I went to watch, oh, what were the blue, the blue people? Avatar. Avatar, 3D. I thought, oh, let's go kids, let's try, and I hadn't tried it in a while, oh no. Two minutes in, I'm like, and I just closed my eyes the whole time. I could not, I could not be part of that three-dimensional movie, and all that moving in a small three in a small IMAX theater. There was no way, so I I just sat there and closed my eyes. And like the Oculus Rift thing, you probably wouldn't do too well with either. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, elevators. I don't know that I'm moving up and down. I feel it on my feet. But you guys know that you're moving up or down because you have your gyroscope inside telling you that. You just know that the elevator is going up or down. When I'm spinning in a carnival ride, I don't know that I'm spinning the way that you do. I feel the pressure on my butt. right? I, feel, I know that I'm being pushed back against something, but I can't tell you which way I'm going. And I'm really fun in a hot tub or a pool because if I close my eyes, and I lift my feet up off the bottom, I can't tell you if I'm upside down, floating sideways. I have no idea, right? Because I've, I've got no gyroscope telling me if I'm up or down. So if I close my eyes and take my feet off the bottom, I have absolutely no signal coming to my brain. And I can't tell you if I'm flying upside down, sideways. It's like zero gravity. Zero gravity. And, and, and I actually went through some NASA experiments at a group at the University of Oregon doing research for NASA, and they put me in these weightlessness scenarios because I don't have the middle, the inner ear hair cells, I was a great test subject for them. So I've had some fun experiences like that, although it wasn't really fun, but giving, getting data for them. Um, but uh, yeah, weightlessness kind of thing, it, it's a, it, even if I just stand here and stand up and close my eyes, I'll start falling, and I won't know it until my feet tell me, right? I have to consciously think about it. Nothing is automatic. Okay, well, isn't that fun, okay? We knew he was weird, but we didn't know why. Okay, okay. So that's what's going on. You see me weave a little bit? It's just, it's just me weaving. I'll get to there somehow. Uh, that is the end of the special senses, and I want to spend the last 20 minutes or so uh, talking to you about the endocrine system. Now, I'm not by any means going to get through all this material. I just want to introduce this to you. You already know some of this. And the endocrine system, what you know is that this is a series of hormone-producing glands, right? And you know where they are. You know about the pancreas, and you know about the thyroid gland, and you know that there's uh, the hypothalamus and the pineal gland in the brain, and you know that the testes and the ovaries secrete hormones. So we know a little bit about this, and you have already identified structurally where these glands are in the body. So let me just remind you that the endocrine system and why it comes here, right, we just finished with the ear, the nervous system. 
oh my, we've been here for a long time. Right, from the day one where I said neuron, <laughs> through the spinal cord, the brain, the autonomic nervous system, all of exam four, and now the special senses, that's really all nervous system. We've been on the nervous system now for four or five chapters. So now we get to the endocrine chapter, and we realize that the endocrine system works very, very closely with the nervous system, and both of them are maintaining your homeostasis, your well-being. Now, they work in very different ways, but they're both they're, they're, they're major players in the homeostasis. Now, they work very differently. Right? The endocrine system works through hormones, whereas the nervous system works through nerve impulses and neurotransmitters, but they both are, they're both sending signals to someplace else to affect something far, far away, aren't they? So we'll be comparing and contrasting this. Now, the other thing I want to share with you here is we're talking about endocrine glands, endocrine system. Remember, endo means within, and crine means to secrete. So endocrine, to secrete within the body, hormones, versus exocrine. Exocrine glands we talked about back with the epithelial uh, cells and the integumentary system. And we talked about merocrine and, per, uh, uh, merocrine and uh, apocrine and holocrine. Okay, those were exocrine glands because what were they doing? Secreting crine, exit, out of the body. So exocrine glands are the glands that secrete something out of the body, like your sweat glands or your tear glands or your salivary glands. Yeah, they're, they're secreting it into your oral cavity, but don't forget that anatomically, everything from mouth to anus really is outside of your body. So everything traveling through your gut tube is really, quote, outside. So the pancreas secretes digestive juices into the duodenum. The stomach secretes acid and enzymes into the stomach. All of that is considered exocrine, okay? It can exit the body versus endocrine. Now, the exocrine glands all secrete their products through a duct, through a series of tubes, versus the endocrine glands produce their products and then release them directly into the bloodstream. There is no duct. There is no tubing. There's no, there's no plumbing okay, involved here. Okay, so that's an important difference. This table, I know it's small, but let me just tell you about it because I think it'll make this really, really clear. One column is how the nervous system works. The other column is how the endocrine system works. And we, I think we know this, but let me just clarify it. So going down on the uh, right side, here's the nervous system, and here's the endocrine system. And all it says is, how do they work? Well, the nervous system works through neurotransmitters that are released in response to nerve impulses, whereas the endocrine system works through releasing hormones into the bloodstream. Okay. What, where do they target? Well, you know that neurons carry information that go to muscle or to glands, right? whereas uh, hormones are going to go to any cell in the body that has a receptor for that hormone. Remember, hormones are going through your blood. Every cell, every tissue in your body is seeing every hormone going through your body, but only the cells that have a receptor for that hormone will, quote, see that hormone. And I'll give you a good example of that at the end. Response time. Well, you know how fast the nervous system works, right? We can move our finger up and down really, really fast. Those nerve signals are going. They're being stopped. Go, stop, go, stop. Hormones are going to be relatively slower, right? Once they're in the bloodstream, they're going to have an effect that can last for minutes to even hours. Again, what do the nerves do? cause either a muscle to contract or a gland to secrete. We've been through all this. What do hormones do? They cause some metabolic change in a cell. They're going to cause something to go up or maybe something to go down. Insulin, glucagon. We talked about um, uh, parathyroid hormone and calcitonin long ago in the skeletal system as two hormones that work in opposite ways. So these hormones have all sorts of effects in the body. Range of effects. Well, again, nervous system is very specific. You have a neuron, you have a nerve going directly to a muscle or directly to a gland. It's a one-way pathway. Whereas the hormones, because they're traveling throughout the body, are more systemic. 
they can have an effect everywhere and have a very widespread effect. How long does it last? Again, milliseconds for nerves, right? It's instantaneous, move the muscle, stop. Move the muscle, stop. Hormones, once floating around the blood, that signal can take a lot longer to, uh, to occur and also longer to recover. So once that hormone's in the bloodstream, it's gonna be there for a while and you may feel the effects of that for a while and the nervous system, right, quick, quick on, quick off. So that table, I think, does a nice job, a reasonable job of walking you through this. Getting a little message here. Let me just fix this. This image, I know it's really difficult for you to see, but you've already done this in lab. You've already identified where these different endocrine glands are. You remember in the brain, there were three. There was a hypothalamus, the pituitary hanging down below, and the little pineal gland. And I told you in lab, the pineal gland was too small to see. You really can't see it on the brain models. And then there was the uh, thymus and the pancreas, and even the kidneys and the stomach secrete hormones. The, the heart even secretes hormones, which is why it's in the picture. And we'll talk about that hormone next, next unit. And then, of course, the pancreas and then the reproductive organs. Underneath that, in too small to see print, are the names of the hormones produced by these glands. We're not going there this, this time. So next semester, we will absolutely talk a lot about hormones. And we'll learn what different hormones do in different systems. I'll mention a few more hormones over the next three or four weeks. But next semester in 106, we'll really dive into, as we talk about the cardiovascular system, we'll talk about the hormones that regulate it. As we talk about the digestive system, we'll talk about insulin and glucagon and the hormones that regulate it. So that's what's coming. For now, we just need to learn the big picture, where are the glands, understand that hormones travel through the blood, and do their job far, far away. Now, I've got about 15 minutes. The rest of this, oh, there's two more things I want to tell you. Um, I've already mentioned endocrine and exocrine. Does that make sense, the difference? Right? One being released to an epithelial border, one being released directly into the blood. This is going back to exocrine. I don't want to confuse you. We talked about this a long time ago. Exocrine, those secretions can be watery, serous, thick, mucousy, or mixed. Your tears are, are serous, right, watery. Your... Um, some of your sweat glands can be, uh, your, your sebaceous glands can be thick and mucousy. Uh, your salivary glands are actually mixed. And we've all experienced this. When someone's cooking a meal, you're really hungry, you start salivating, right? And that's kind of watery. That's got a lot of digestive enzymes in it. You're ready to start digesting that meal. But if you're scared, you kind of go cotton mouth. Or maybe you start getting really thick secretions. Or you wake up in the morning and you go, right, kind of thick. So we know that the salivary glands can put out both watery and thick mucousy stuff. So for that reason, salivary glands are considered mixed glands. But again, those are exocrine, aren't they? Just a couple more little tidbits, and then I'll tell you a nice little story. If you were having any issues with your hormone balances, you would go see an endocrinologist. Now, your general doctor usually is well-trained, and I don't want to diss any doctors, but your general doctors are usually very well trained in dealing with more common issues like diabetes. So a, a regular general doctor or physician can deal with insulin and, and diabetes, typically. Or uh, most OBGYNs spend a lot of time learning about the female hormone cycles and can regulate issues and problems there. Um, a regular doctor usually can deal with normal thyroid issues, right, thyroid problems. But outside of that, some of the other hormonal issues are really very specialized and really, I think, personally, need the attention of a specialist, a person who's an endocrinologist who can really, who spends their entire day thinking about this and treating these disorders. Because these hormones have vast effects. A little bit off in one hormone can have effects not in one system, but in multiple systems. And you don't want to mess that with a doctor who's 
who spends all day doing all sorts of things, you want to go to the source, the, the specialist. So, you know, if you have any of those more unusual issues with hormones, you definitely don't want to play around. Again, that's just my opinion. Uh, or ask your regular doctor for a referral. Now, again, hormones are floating through your body, and they're only, remember, they're floating everywhere, but they're only going to be detected by cells in the body that have a receptor for that hormone. So, for example, uh, testosterone is released, right, um, and has an effect on muscle and has an effect on the reproductive organs, but really doesn't have much of an effect on the stomach or doesn't have an effect on the liver. Other hormones are released from one place and then have an effect somewhere else. Your stomach hormones, some of them tell you that you're hungry or full. So those signals would go to your brain to say, stop eating, dummy, right? But they're not going to have a direct effect on other organs. So again, we see that hormones are released and are only received or detected by cells that have the hormone receptor. Now, the cells that have the receptor are considered the targets. What's the target of that hormone? And again, we'll talk about these specifics next uh, semester. I also want to say this. Hormones come in a few different flavors, a few different types. Some hormones are proteins. Okay, They're proteins. They float around in the blood, and they're proteins. Other hormones are steroids. Now, we haven't talked about steroids since Chapter 2, and that was that horrid chemistry chapter. But you may remember that steroids were one of the examples of lipids. Steroids are fats. They are lipids. And all of your steroid hormones, like testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, all of those hormones are cholesterol-based lipid molecules. And this is why, ladies, and everyone needs to know this, you read these commercials right now about men with low T levels, low testosterone. And one of the ways that guys up their testosterone levels is put on this androgel in the armpit. And then the warning says, if you're pregnant or think you are pregnant, you should not hang around a guy's armpit who just put androgel there. And small kids should not you know, run around and hug daddy too much under the armpit if we just put androgel on. The reason is, it's a steroid. Steroids are hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means that they can be taken up directly through the skin. That's why there can be testosterone patches, estrogen patches, those hormones, those molecules can be absorbed directly through the skin. So you wouldn't want, right, to be hanging around that too much because um, those hormones can directly go into your body and affect anyone else who touches them. And if you swim in it, you could have some issues, right? Or you are constantly being exposed to those hormones. Now, this is where I take a little aside and I, and I ask you, have you ever heard of a condition called AIS? androgen insensitivity syndrome. And I'll spend the last 10 minutes just kind of as a story, okay? So you can put your pencils down and just kind of listen. And I suspect now I'll get a couple short papers on this topic because it's really, really kind of cool. So androgen insensitivity syndrome. Androgen are a group of hormones of which testosterone is one. And before I go there, let me remind you that all of us are by default female in our early development. I may have mentioned that in passing long ago that developmentally all of us are female, and if there's a Y chromosome present, and if the right hormones are being released by the early male fetus, then the, the fetus is masculinized, right? The male plumbing is formed, the male reproductive structures are formed. But if you don't have those signals, then the body will continue on a female path, and that's kind of the default. Female development is default. There is a group of individuals, a group of disorders, where there's no testosterone receptor. So the body's making testosterone, but the body can't see the testosterone because there's no receptor. This is similar to type 2 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, the problem isn't with the pancreas. The problem isn't with the insulin. The problem is with the receptor. So there's no longer the responsiveness to the insulin. And so these individuals have an endocrine disorder type 2 diabetes because they have a receptor issue. The story I want to tell you about is AIS. Um, this is a situation where genetic males, right, they are XY. They have testes. They're producing testosterone, but they don't have a testosterone receptor. So their body's like, I don't see any testosterone. 
so they develop as females. So this is what happens in AIS, AIS, androgen insensitivity syndrome. There is a subset of supermodels who have this disorder. Now, I'm not suggesting that all supermodels have this, but it is a higher percentage of supermodels. Um, I'm going to say the word Jamie Lee Curtis. Anybody know Jamie Lee Curtis? OK. Um, supermodel, turn super action hero kind of person, right? Now she's getting older, she's doing activity commercials. Um, tall, 5'10", muscular, athletic woman, square jaw, thin hips. Genetically, male. Physically, supermodel female. What's going on? So in early development, right, male, testes, producing testosterone, but the body doesn't have the receptors for the testosterone. So it's as if the testosterone is not being made. So we default produce female structures, breasts, vagina, but no internal structures, no, no internal plumbing, no uterus, no ovaries. They're still testes. They're up in the abdominal cavity. There's no place for them to go. There's no scrotum. So they don't go down and, and go into the scrotum as they normally would in a male. Physically, beautiful female. Tall, athletic, clearly female. All regards. Menses comes along. Time for menstruation. No menstruation. There's no uterus. There's nothing to menstruate. Well, these are really athletic women. Typically, they're tall, athletic women. So if you don't have enough body fat on your body, right? Anorexics don't menstruate because they don't have enough body fat. So very athletic women sometimes don't menstruate. They have spotty or very delayed menses, or at least no one's really too worried about it. Oh, they're just really athletic. They don't have much body fat. It'll happen, and it doesn't happen. And sometimes they go all the way to be married before they realize that anatomically they have a blind pouch. There's, no, there's a vagina that goes nowhere. So there's no internal structures there. Um, externally, female. Everything about them is female. Okay, now, Jamie Lee Curtis, if you go online, you're going to see, it's going to say, urban myth, Jamie Lee Curtis, hermaphrodite. Now, what's a hermaphrodite? Hermaphrodite's an earthworm. It has both functioning male and female parts. There are no human hermaphrodites. So, Jamie Lee Curtis has never come out and said that she has this disorder, although there are rumors that it has been diagnosed and never disclosed. But there are other supermodels. And if you'll go on and just look up AIS, you'll see this whole help site for women with AIS who have androgen and sensitivity syndrome and who have decided it's, you know, it's worth talking about. They're female by all regards. I suspect, and again, this is just off the record, Brit was it Brittany Joyner? The the tall African-American uh, basketball player at Baylor a couple years ago, spoke like this, about six foot five, muscular, phenomenal athlete, I suspect AIS. Um, the Jamaican runner a few years ago in the Olympics, who was just blowing away everybody and was like, looked like some massive steroid thing, I suspect AIS or some form of it. Some of those Eastern European swimmers of old days, they, you know, these women had beards. AIS, I would suspect. Now, um, it's a really interesting topic, and it does kind of blur the line of, of hormones and gender and sex and all sorts of interesting things. Um, I was going to say something else about this, too. Oh, women, back to the testosterone story, right? So women can have, make, women make testosterone, right? But you make your testosterone, you don't have any testes, you make testosterone from your adrenal glands in small amounts. Women can have an adrenal tumor. And their adrenal glands during pregnancy can be overproducing the testosterone. And it's possible to kind of go the other way around. And these are really extreme cases. But a little girl who is being bathed in testosterone during development could become masculinized. All right, so a little girl fetus could be born with some male-looking structures because that little girl has been seeing testosterone throughout the pregnancy because mama's adrenal glands are overworking with a little tumor in there and producing testosterone levels at the level of a male baby. And it's the same reason you don't want to be bathing in or laying up next to the guy with the androgel because if you're pregnant and you've got a little girl fetus, and it happened over and over and over in large amounts, 
you would risk the, the possibility of that testosterone absorbing into your body, into the baby's bloodstream, and actually masculinizing some of her, her structures. So we don't want to mess around with hormones, right? They're really massive. And one of the other things about hormones is that they work in very, very low concentrations. So it doesn't take much to have massive effects. So that's my little, you know, fun little take-home lesson um, about hormones. And um, hopefully you have a better appreciation of that and maybe even some little story for dinner time tonight. But look up AIS if you're interested. If you don't have your topic yet for short paper, maybe you'll find that interesting. And that finishes up everything that I'm going to be doing on the short on the uh, take-home exam stuff. Next Tuesday, we'll start with blood. We're right on schedule. We'll start with blood. We'll do heart, and we'll do vessels. We've got three more lectures. Those three lectures will be on the cardiovascular exam right before Thanksgiving. We come back, and we'll do respiratory, urinary, and reproductive. Those three systems are the final exam. Question? So people with AIS, they can't pitch, right? Right. They'd be sterile. Okay. So the right. No, no ability. There's no, there's no inside plumbing. No, no, no uterus. Um, so look it up. It's, it's a real syndrome. I don't want to pick on Jamie Lee Curtis, but that's somebody maybe you recognize. Okay. I will see you all next time.